word why. What a curious word. The kind of word that can make us cringe, feel defensive, or even distant. But you know, sometimes why is the key. A key that can unlock so much to our lives. Join me as we explore the why with fascinating contributors to the world. Those that entertain us, inform us, teach us about life, and if we're lucky, inspire the next in all of us. I'm your host, Dr. Rod Berger, and welcome to Headroom, a production of Rainlight and co-produced by Old Soul. Let's go. Well, for those of you that love story, I have a real treat for you today. We're going to be spending time with the author of My American Dream, A Journey from Fascism to Freedom with Barbara Sommerfagan. For those of you who can see it, here's a, here's a picture of Barbara in 1940, just six weeks after the fall of France to Nazi Germany. She, her mother, and her father took a 17-day journey by train with 14 stops, fearing they'd be taken off the train at each stop, but they made it all the way to the United States uh, and to a small town uh, in the state of Washington. We spent time with Barbara to talk about her book, the journal that was discovered 73 years later by her sister, a journal that her father wrote of trying to get visas, being bounced around, knowing that he had fought for the Germans in World War I and then was being chased by the Germans during World War II. In an effort to save his family, uh, he did everything that he could, uh, and they did just that, and they were able to escape. This is a fantastic story. I think you're going to learn a lot about Barbara, who, by the way, was an incredible advertising executive, uh, one of the top in her field uh, during the Mad Men era of advertising, no less. Uh, she was a part of some incredibly famous campaigns. Um, don't, you know, friends don't let friends drive drunk, if you remember that from years and, and decades ago. Uh, just an incredible story, an incredible person. And we're joined by her son, Peter Fagan. He is the president of the Milwaukee Bucks. Uh, so those that know, I love basketball and sports. I mean, this has a little bit of everything. Um, I come from, I'm first generation German, and my father grew up during World War II in Germany. Um, I love basketball and sports, and we have just a story and a book that I believe should be in almost every classroom across America. You learn so much about people, family, dreams, uh, and perseverance, and ultimately caring. So I hope that you've enjoyed, you will enjoy this as much as I did uh, in spending time with both Barbara and Peter. I don't even know the word to say. Uh, I first wanted to say what a treat it is to be spending time with the, our two guests today on this episode. This is an episode, though, that cuts very deep for me personally. And so if you will allow me uh, as an audience to share where appropriate, uh, I'd like to do that because, as you know, and those who follow me, story to me is everything. And as I said in my my TEDx talk, story is our currency. And we're going to explore a story that I think, uh, by its title, My American Dream, is just that. And I think it is a wake-up call for young and old, experienced and the inexperienced, in trying to understand culture and how we all fit together uh, and how we can care about and be interested in our neighbor uh, and the outcome of their, of our neighbors and their children uh, at large. We are spending time with author Barbara Summer Fagan, uh, My American Dream, A Journey from Fascism to Freedom, and her son, Peter Fagan. Uh, he is the president of the Milwaukee Bucks, and we were talking off air a little bit of basketball and my love of uh, NBA basketball and the Detroit Pistons. So maybe we get, a little, get into that a little bit because I know, Barbara, you are the number one Milwaukee Bucks fan. Uh, and these are exciting times for you. It's it's often Dame time for you, I'm sure. <laughs> um, as often as possible. <laughs> as often as possible, right? Right. Okay, so this is a book, and I want people who see it on, on video here. Uh, I cannot recommend this in, uh, anymore. I, I've been sharing it with neighbors. I, I've shared with my wife. I said, this has got to be the next book that you read. Um, this is a book of discovery, Barbara, uh, from my from my perspective. Can you tell me what the power of story, let's start this in a, in a broad sense. Tell me about the power of story and what it meant to you prior to your sister Carolyn discovering your father's journal and what it means to you now, the concept of story. Well, I think uh, prior to my sister's uh, discovery of my father's journal, um, there was a, a real gap in my in my story, 
uh, there was a whole piece of it that I didn't know and I didn't understand and I didn't even know enough to ask questions about it of my parents and so on. Uh, we escaped from Nazi Germany in uh, July of 1940 and I knew that we had escaped but I didn't know anything at all about the details of this escape. This escape. My parents never spoke about it. Uh, I I didn't ask any questions. I was I was this little German immigrant girl who didn't speak English, and I was just focused on becoming an authentic American. So when I learned about my father's journal, in his own words, in his own handwriting, and I read it, it just sent a shock, an emotional shock, through my through my brain, through my whole system. I learned so much about, first of all, the escape, you know, the, the horror and the terror involved in my families having to run for our lives, really, literally. And it was run a, 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 a 17-day journey by train with 14 stops, and at every stop, I would imagine that the utter fear and terror that something something will divert sort of this pursuit of freedom. I, I'm wondering, Barbara, and then I'm going to get the, because I'd love, P Peter, that you're on, because I think to see generationally the impact is so important in understanding sort of why we should be sharing stories uh, of our lineage, because it does, I think, impact our decisions in the way in which we interact with the world. Barbara, did there ever feel a sense in those initial days of discovering the journal of loss? Because when I've talked to people who have found sort of, or uncovered, some call it a secret, some call it maybe a gap. There is also on the other side of the coin, the sense of loss in essence that they almost, it's like a warm feeling. You want to know sort of where you come from. You'll hear that from people that don't know their parents or they discover them later in life. They're happy, right? They're, they're elated, but there's this sense of loss that is hard to put into words. Did you feel that at any point in time? I, I, uh, I sort of can, can relate to what you're talking to. I didn't think of it as loss. I, I thought, oh my goodness, there are so many questions that I wish I had asked my parents, and it, I didn't even think to ask my parents because I didn't really know enough about what had gone on and what they experienced and what terrific, amazing strength of character they had to cope with all of this, to, to imagine going on a 17-day terrifying train trip on this horrible, horrible train that was dirty and messy, and there were days when there was no food, there was nothing to drink, with a two-year-old. Oh my gosh! I mean, just going across the country with a two-year-old is, is sort of a, a major, a major task. So I learned so much about my parents in reading this journal. It it um, really fostered in me a, a desire to know so much more. And so maybe that is loss. I didn't call it that, but yes, um, I Peter, wish I'd known more. I wish I'd asked more. Yeah, and, and Peter, I'm wondering. This is where you and I are are similar, and we I think we share some similar broad stroke um, experiences in this because I was the only. I'm I'm first generation German, and my father grew up during World War II in Germany, and I was the only one that he told his story to, and I remember as wow. a boy. <laughs> Finding in my own in my own way, finding a path to pride for what he had survived, and that is something that I have had to pull from in my own sort of mind in times of distress during my own life. And I'm wondering, sort of the experience you have not only in in holding the news of your family once it was revealed, but then the application of that. Um, in sort of an outwardly fashion and or with your own family? Well, I would take it from the baseline of didn't really know my grandparents' story and, and certainly knew my, my, my grandfather and my grandmother, you know, early, early on in life. And, and just their, uh, their story I did know was so incredible. You know, this is like these are immigrants who moved to Chehalis, Washington. I've been to this town that's, you know, a few thousand people. This is like of little means, like, brought it together. My grandmother had kind of been sick through my mother's life. Like all these things were, were, were these unbelievable struggles that they just kind of like was normalized like life. And it kind of like 
kind of set the tone of like how lucky we were as the next generation to, you know, how good we had it, you know, and, and, and kind of the struggles that this generation, then of course, you know, when, when my aunt and, and my mother start exploring this journal, you kind of sit there and go, oh, we, we, we knew nothing. Like this is the tip of the iceberg of, of what real struggle and, and kind of overcoming and perseverance is, is really like. Um, in, and, and then of course, as you grow older, you realize like what it is to, you know, what it could possibly be like to be like a first generation immigrant, like in this country. And it's kind of a, it's kind of a, weird time now, you know, and what we're dealing with, with like immigration, like in this country, like now. So it, it, it's very, very cognizant as we were growing up. And we certainly knew, like, we came from a Jewish, mo- uh, a, a German mother and German grandparents, as you know, like Germans uh, are, are, are very distinct. Like there was no, there was no question. I'm sure there are many stories we could share, share off yeah. air. Uh, okay. So it's one thing to know a story and to, I think, sit with that and understand, wow, it's the tip of the iceberg. And I love that. I love that because I understand that that resonates for me, Peter. Did it change your relationship with your mother? And if so, how? No, I don't think so. Cause I think we shared the same gap. I think incredibly, you know, as she, you know, this is all in the last five to, you know, 10 years, she got this revelation and, and information at the same time we did it, like what the depth and the story was. So in an interesting way, we kind of were both in the dark of the details of this story, which is kind of incredible to, to get, I mean, bits and pieces and, and certainly knew like kind of they had made this, you know, struggle, certainly knew they did not speak English, certainly knew they were professionals in Germany and had to start a life in U.S. knew, I mean, knew my mother's history intimately. Like there was, you know, that's the interesting thing is like her generation, there's, there's not a chapter missed, but uh, I think the timing and the discovery of this was kind of interesting for both generations in that we were, we were both like learning in real time. I think that's fascinating, Barbara, that, that your son can feel that same gap as if you're two cars riding next to each other on a freeway. It's not that you're a few exits, you know, you're a few stops in front of him that he can align with that. I think that says a lot about your relationship, even if there was a gap. I, I'm really curious, Barbara, I, I find that people, when we think about World War II broadly, the, the relationship people have to secrets and anxiety are incredible and sort of in a very bright way paint a picture of human emotion and sort of not knowing what's around the corner and depending upon people's experiences and or their family's experiences they either embrace um the not knowing and would rather not know um and there are those that sort of have that sort of low boil uh, of anxiety throughout their lifetime i know that's how my father was he didn't want to talk about it. It represented a major left turn in his life when he had dreams of something very different. He didn't have dreams of, of cleaning up a war-torn Germany after the war as a kid. You know, that was not in what he had ever dreamed, as many kids right. wouldn't. Do you think about the anxiety and the secrets that were held by your parents? And does it give you a different... Um, not that you did, I mean, you obviously have great reverence for your for your parents and their story, but does it take it to a different level when you think about that? Having to be refugees in a land, in a small town in the state of Washington where maybe stood out uh, and maybe not for the reasons that <laughs> yes. were, you'd want to market around from a tourism perspective. Right? Yes, yes. Well, certainly uh, we stood out. There was no one like us in this town this little refugee family who spoke no English and had nothing. We came with nothing, $10.50. And my father brought a tent thinking we may have to live in this tent because he had no idea how he would go about making a life for us. He was very, very determined and had great perseverance. And some, and, and I think both my parents had, had enormous optimism and were so thrilled thrilled to be in the land of the free because it meant that they could they could be who they wanted to be they could do what they wanted to do and one way or another they would make it work you know when you talk about secrets i i don't know that they thought they were keeping secrets um let me tell you what i mean i uh, i think they were very 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 focused on going forward and making a life 
and really were not so so much about going backward. And and uh, you know, I think they just kept trying to move ahead and trying to make a life, and and they were successful. But you know, it was a it was a challenge, and um, it was tough. You know, in in retrospect. I, on the other hand, had a wonderful life. I loved being in Chehalis. I loved becoming an American girl. I had great friends. I had a great time. And I never thought very much about there being secrets. I, too, was focused on, on going ahead. The second thing about my parents is, is sort of to your point, um, I think that they had gone through very tough times in, in uh, Germany, particularly at the end with the persecution of Jews. My father was a Jew uh, and and he waited a very long time to try to get out of Germany because he had been in the uh, Air Force in Germany, the German Air Force in World War I. And he always felt that he had given to Germany so Germany would take care of him. And he was sort of caught because he waited so long that um, it was very, very difficult to get out. And, and um, he lost his parents. His parents were murdered in the concentration camps. And this was all sort of a horrific set of memories and so forth. And I think probably like many people, your father included, uh, they tried to sort of suppress, repress those memories. And then as Peter said, my mother had a lot of health problems very early on and throughout the rest of her life. And that took a lot of the family's sort of psychological energy, you know, to kind of deal deal with those problems. So those were some of the reasons that that I, I think they didn't talk about what had happened. But I don't think they were focused, I mean, I don't know, but I don't think they were focused on keeping a secret from me. I think they were just focused on moving ahead. Peter, I want to talk about uh, your grandfather. So in, in the book, and I, and I love this, I'm going to, I'm going to quote, uh, from his journal, uh, when we're, you know, they're trying to, we're talking about visas and just the experience of this. Um, and, and basically being, it feels like when I read it, I just felt that they were human pinballs, right? It was just this at a moment's notice, all of a sudden we can't go here because now, you know, this country is now engaged in the war and now that ship's not going to America. So we're, we're getting bumped all over the place. And he, he has this one statement. He said, we had only the keys to paradise. We had only the keys to paradise and we could not enter. What an, ex I think, you know, Peter, I'm going to, I'm going to put down our own gender here, but, you know, sort of, and you go back to that point in time in history. I, for a, I just love his expressiveness. There's something about that. Right. that I don't want to take for granted when I read that. Given the time, given the circumstance, given sort of the background that you were sort of on the edges and the outs in the margins talking about sort of Germans as people in that regard, there's something really powerful in what he's saying that I think people can connect to even if they weren't trying to escape fascism. Tell me about your grandfather in that regard and this sort of poetic nature. There's something very poetic about the way he writes that makes you feel that you're right there and also say, I couldn't have done it. And I just wonder how you experienced that passage. Yeah, I would just tell you that, you know, my grandfather was, you know, again, the the nicest stoic kind of German, you know, <laughs> grandpa you could ever have. The fact that the fact that he's so expressive and descriptive and kind of had written this is kind of like mind-boggling to me. You know, what when we said it, I mean, love the guy, was incredible, you know, took long walks, like as I remember, like in New York City, kind of growing up. But this was not uh, somebody who I would say would eloquently like write about the history of the world in, in like such incredible prose. Like to is it almost feel like it's someone you, it's not your grandfather when you read it? Is it that kind of experience? Well, it makes me think like kind of like I didn't know I didn't know, I didn't know what I didn't know. You know, like this is somebody with so much depth and like it's so cool. You know that this that this that he had so much and like what he experienced and it goes back to like. I couldn't even fathom, like, I, we led such a privileged life in kind of experience and and kind of the non-struggles of of everything that, that this guy is, like, literally kind of poetically putting, like, his history, the world's history, you know, down on paper in such a cool way. 
so you're very successful in business. So let's let's sort of conduct an audit here, if you don't mind, Peter. Sure, a situation is, analysis or a few yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, now, I, I'm just curious from your perspective, because you do have a very, I mean, look, there's a picture in the book with you on the front lawn with your grandpa, you know, like just the relationship and the way you talk about him uh, and your your face lights up, I think says so much about that relationship. And those of us that, that have had the, the privilege of a, a loving grandparent can understand that. There's so much good and resilience that comes out of this story in this book. And I'm wondering if you are, if you're taking emotion and setting it to the side, what do you, where do you find residue where there was impact? And, and not, from a, not from Sorry. a negative perspective, but from a, just we're human beings. And, you know, where would we have seen potential impacts that you overcame as a family, but that they're fair reminders to you as an individual and as a son and as a, a grandson. Well, I, I'd almost take the inheritance of like delusional optimism. So I wouldn't say like that maybe my mother had some of it. I, my, yeah. me in my own world, like I just, I, I've kind of like always attack things and, and like, we'll figure out a solution. How do we do this? I think it's, it's certainly like defined in like my grandparents' life. Like these are people who didn't even know the roadmap, didn't even see the road, but it was going, they had the keys to paradise. Like they were going to open the door. Like, no matter what they were, I mean, these are, they had real life things, you know, like we have no money, we have no house, we don't speak the language, we're going to live. You know, those are, those are like, those are, those are substantive compared to like the things I go through in life. And, and, uh, you know, I'd also say like the, the real residual, it's like, these are people who every day, 24, seven, 365, like work towards, work towards the growth and success of their family. And that's like what my parents did. And I thought it was normal. You know, I thought that was just like normal, you know, regular things for your parents to be completely dedicated to your, to your kids and the growth of the kids. And that generationally has obviously like come down that this will be a better life, you know, going forward. And it's kind of a, I mean, I see it as this like delusional arc of op optimism. <laughs> like this is, this is the, the foundation. Everything is so good that like it will continue to get better. And, you know, to what my mom says, like, I get it. It's this look forward. Like it is like, how do we, how do we march ahead and really don't think about, you know, kind of the, the struggle behind, but, but, you know, I mean, listen, the importance of the history and the struggle is kind of the basis of, of how you, of how you go forward. But I, I totally get it. I mean, that's the one thing I, I kind of understood like why my grandfather didn't tell about tell me anything to do about the the trip or the struggle. I mean, his focus was tell me about you, tell me about the promise, what an unbelievable country, believed in education like you couldn't imagine. My mother was like a great example of that, kind of like breaking the barriers, you know, in higher education to do it. So it it it's kind of like an interesting, you know, the this is, I mean, and to me, it's 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 the American dream. I mean, period. It is like why we live in such a great place. Very, very well put, Peter. Um, Barbara, how do you think your parents, let, let's sort of pivot to today with a nod towards history. How do you think your parents would, would feel about the world that we live in now, which sadly is, is a world where I live in a state where they're banning books. Um, you know, we're, we're having, and I think about my late father and think that he, I think he would be absolutely speechless uh, as to the the lack of lessons learned in how to treat people uh, and understand the beauty of different cultures from around the world. I mean, I remember, and I just can't believe it as well, but I mean, in third grade, I remember being beat up on the playground because one kid said that my dad lived in Germany during the war. And so these kids oh, pinned me up against a wall and beat me up. When I was at university in the 90s, I had a professor that knew some of my backstory and a student stood up and called me, not knowing even my background or my ethnicity, nothing, and called me a book-burning Nazi. And this is a major university in the 90s. And you just think, wow, I, I, you know, those are just two experiences from one, from one you know, middle-aged white guy in middle America. Um, and I'm just wondering, when you sit back, how do you think about how your family writ large would be thinking about those that are not here with us anymore, a, a world that we live in right now where we are, sadly, it feels like returning to uh, a very dark state of the world. 
before I answer your question, I have to I have to just tell you one little story. When I was in the second grade, and my family had emigrated, immigrated, you know, uh, maybe five years before that. Um, I was going home from school and this group of boys was chasing me, screaming at me, you dirty Nazi, you dirty Nazi. And I was terrified. I didn't know what to do. I thought they were going to hurt me, beat me up like they did you. And so I ran into the, the um, restroom of a service station, <laughs> a gas station. And um, I locked the door and they are yelling outside and shouting outside, you dirty Nazi. And finally they went away and I waited and waited and it was quiet and I thought I could go home and I was locked in. And I thought, oh my God, what am I gonna do? So there was a window over the sink and I had to climb up on the sink and crawl out through the window. And I ran home through the back streets crying and sobbing and, I told my mother, and it kind of relates to the question that you asked, my mother was stunned. She said, here it was that we, we, we ran for our lives to escape from the Nazis. And my daughter is being called a dirty Nazi. How can this be happening? So I think that would be my parents' reaction to what's going on today. How can this be happening in the land of the free the land that we came to so that my and my father says this in his journal so that we can be who we want to be we can do what we want to do we can strive for what we want to achieve and very importantly to your point we can read what we want to read we can listen to the radio which was a very big thing and get different points of view about different issues and so forth I think they would just be in a state of stunned, horrified disbelief, uh, crushed. Peter, have you heard that deeply, story before? Deeply, deeply crushed. I heard. I've been spending a lot of time with my mother over the last. <laughs> yes, there's very few stories I have not heard. And and as a son, how do you how do you experience that? Because I didn't have that. I didn't have that sort of lane of a story where it would have been a mother, right? I had stories of a, of a young boy being my dad and physical altercations just during war and, and different part, you know, that was a different element. But to hear about your mom being chased and these sorts of things, I, I, I don't know how, how that sits or lands for you. Yeah, I mean, I, uncomfortable, like just, you know, kind of like almost horrified, you know, how, how you can, you know, kind of whatever the next level of, of kind of how tough it is for young kids to survive mean spiritedness among each other and then times it by a hundred, you know, just not good. Now I, this is going to be a, a hard left turn, but Barbara, you are an American treasure. I'm going to say that uh, for what that's worth. But when you, this is why this book, I cannot recommend this more. I, whether you're a lover of history or of just a good story and or of female empowerment. I mean, it kind of has it all. Uh, and I just think we're lucky that you chose to put the effort in to write a book. Um, you know, you, you were, oh, there are so many ways I could put this, but I want, it would go off the rails and sort of the, the spirit of the discussion, but boy, did you ever just disrupt the advertising world <laughs> as a female executive, <laughs> right? I mean, you were, you were, you were sort of like during the Don Draper Mad Men era, right? And right. I just, I, on the heels of you talking about that story and, and being chased and then being, gosh, the sense of feeling locked in. I mean, just that laying over sort of the story of your parents and that concept of feeling locked in without any way out to your dad's point about having the keys to paradise and not being able to get there. You as a girl found a way out. You know, you didn't run and hide. You, it seems like you did the opposite. I mean, you were uh, many times, and please correct me, you were the only female in the room, right? Many and times. you were leading yes. major campaigns, like friends don't let friends, you know, drive drunk camp. I mean, these were iconic ads that you, uh, you played such a pivotal role in. Do you think it's, is it just irony or is it just happenstance that you went into a business where storytelling was at the forefront? when story was so rich inside of you and your family, even if you didn't know it was there, but it was like the spirit of storytelling was right there? That is a fantastic question. Um, 
I really didn't think about this consciously. Uh, I, I wanted to go into marketing and uh, in my time, the way to go into marketing was through product management or brand management. That was sort of a career building stepping stone sort of. And women simply could not get jobs in marketing, in, in uh, product and brand management. So I went through the back door into market research. And um, I, I had my first job at, at the Vic Chemical Company as a market research trainee. I was there for about a year. I uh, got very good feedback about my performance, decided it was time to go and talk to my boss about my career path. And I did. I, I made an appointment sort of nervously went in and sat down across from him and said, Tom, you know, I've been here for a year. You've given me very good feedback. Really want to talk to you about my career path. And he sort of stared at me for a moment and, and he said, well, there is no career path. I said, what do you mean? And he threw his head back and started laughing, like roaring with laughter. And I said, well, why are you laughing? And he said, well, women. I said, yes. Women, they get married, they have babies, and they leave. And I said, well, Tom, I do plan to get married. I plan to have babies, but I went to business school. I plan to have a career. Well, he said, Barbara, if that's what you want, you're going to have to leave because I can't help you with that. And from there, I found my way into the advertising business, which I love right from the get-go. I loved it. I, I, I love the combination of strategic thinking and planning and creative solution developing. You know, I, and I love the collaboration aspect of it. Um, I didn't think consciously about the storytelling aspect of it, but that's what it's all about. You're absolutely right. You, you got a and, chance to uh, control the narrative, Barbara. I mean, if you think about it, the, what your mother and father said when you were chased, right? I mean, their dismay at one, not even knowing who you were in your background, right? And misappropriating uh, labels and, and, and such, you didn't have a chance to control that narrative. They, they had, they, they were misinformed right and sadly that played out in a memory that you will always have that will be that's mm -hmm. burned in your in your mind in advertising you you have the opportunity to shape which i think is incredible with words and images peter what would do you, <laughs> what do you think it would have been like to have been in a boardroom with your mother I bet oh, it was not, immense not, pride. Not enjoyable. I think it's good we don't work together. <laughs> that, we're, that, we're, that we're mother and son. I mean, she's probably horrified that I say that. My, my mother's <laughs> discipline and standards and process are so beyond mine. Like, I think she'd be, I'd be demoted instead of promoted. Like, oh, never, never, never. <laughs> so, but, you know, you talk about, you, you talk about what you know and everything. I mean, my whole professional foundation is based on my my parents you know kind of like that was our lives and like how rare you know as you grow up in the 80s and 90s that you have you know two professional parents and one's a mother like running like a you know one of the largest ad agencies in the world and your your breakfast discussion is 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 you know about product placement is about is about return on investment, is about research and demographics. And, and that's, you know, so personally for me, what injected me with this like incredible, you know, kind of desire to want to be in brand management, to want to be in marketing and want to be in sales. So, you know, it, it, it's kind of this incredible, you know, advantage to, uh, to have had her experience like on a daily basis, just, and it, it is like literally, you know, everything I have become and kind of get excited about. You, you know, the way you say that and the way you sort of lean into the camera, Peter, it's like you're taking us back to the kitchen table when you were young, eating your Cheerios, like, Mom, I just, I'm just getting ready for school. <laughs> no, it, it was it was great. I mean, it's fun to, like, listen, the ad business is that the science and the art, you know, of, of what goes into, you know, the, the positioning of, of, of brands and, and growth of consumer products, you know, how it affects, like, you know, those were like, well, we talked about, you know, kind of for fun because my parents made sure we were all together. And when we were all together, we talked about what they did too, not just what we did. Uh, Barbara, is there a great irony in the timing of this book? I mean, we're seeing a rise in anti-Semitism around the world. Um, you know, this this feels to me like a book that students should be reading yes. as a way to not only educate themselves about the history 
um, but for them to reflect on maybe biases that they are a part of now um, that are not based in fact and or humanity. Uh, and I'm wondering, is this, how do you feel about it? Do you feel as if you're an ambassador for, for these, these really deep uh, emotional topics? Where, where do you sit given that every night there's a conversation on the news um, about topics that you touch on in this book? Well, I, I, uh, I very much always have hope that, that my book would have an educational impact um, because I think today so many young people and older people as well really don't know anything much about the Holocaust and some of them don't even know the word. You know, so, so even before we were in this intense period that we are right now, I, I, I really had in mind that there would be an educational aspect to the effect of this. And interestingly, my high school in Chehalis, Washington, put the book into its curriculum for that reason. Um, That's you incredible. Know, they, yeah. And uh, they invited me to come out and talk with the students last spring. Uh, they had they had been studying the book and analyzing the book and so forth. And it was it was just a fabulous experience because really I could see that the story had the kind of effect on these kids that I had kind of hoped and dreamed that it would. So it would be great to have that happen on a broader scale, obviously. But I know it can happen, and it's beginning to happen a little bit. So I'm I'm very uh, gratified about that. You know, I'll, I'll say this. I think there's a picture in the book um, of your brother, Michael, Peter. Um, and he's just, you know, he's sitting. Well, so if, if people will, if we show the video of this, it's just this <laughs> happy, you know, go lucky kid. And it seems it says so much more to me than just this is a, let's say, a toddler sort of sitting there, you know, posing for a photo. Because kids can really wear the residue of their parents' histories and legacies, and you see it. It's the nonverbals, it's the shoulders, it's maybe the lack of a smile, the challenges that they are a part of that they didn't sign up for. There's none of that on Michael. And that, to me, really speaks to that sort of that, that delusion in a very positive way that mm. you spoke about earlier, Peter. Um, I would imagine that you're just filled with sort of gratefulness for the family that you were born into because you know, not only did they teach you perseverance, but it seems to me like they did it with open arms and that should not be overlooked. No question. First on the photo, I love the romper. Like we've been trying to get adult sizes. <laughs> that outfit. We've been trying to look for adult sizes in that outfit for decades. Like, to, you know, like if we could find that outfit and, and kind of get that, it'd be just such a big win for us. In, in, in but I, I think, yeah, we, I mean, listen, I tell, I tell, everybody and anybody like how, how lucky, you know, um, I was like my family is how it's like such an opportunity to take like advantage of it. Just like our, our basic, you know, kind of like a family that has a, has a great work ethic. I mean, I, I would say like one of the incredible things about us is, you know, through the hardest times, like whether it was like, you know, through my father's sickness and death and, and, uh, or through anything. I mean, one of the, I mean, I would say the overwhelming theme is laughter. And like, when, I mean, we like, we will laugh as I do in business all the time. And I tell people like, if we're not having, if we can't have fun. Well, if you can't have fun at an NBA team and you can't have fun in the entertainment, <laughs> like, there's something wrong. But I, I mean, I think not only just persevere, but I mean, like we went to the other level of like, we had a lot of fun. You know, this was like how to enjoy, you know, and how to, how to really look to the good of everything. Barbara, is there something that you left out of the book that in hindsight, given the what sounds like incredible uh, response that you've had to it, that you either wish you would have added, even if it was just an anecdote? Is the, Tell me about sort of that, because a lot of authors will think, you know, right after it's published, they think, I wonder if I should have included that or gone into more detail, because I never thought people would resonate <laughs> with this one little point. No. <laughs> you laid it all like out for you've us. You've got it all. <laughs> 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 well, I hope that more people pay attention to it, read it. Uh, I think both of you are such a great example of the American dream and a family that sticks together uh, through tragedy and triumph. 
uh, My American Dream, A Journey from Fascism to Freedom. Let's close with this, Barbara. What do you, what's, what's the moral of the story? And But from not your, your eyes now in 2024, but from this girl that's you, we should, we should say the, the cover of the book is a picture of you that was taken um, at the conclusion of your journey, correct? That, that was taken when we arrived on the dock yeah. from our ship, our trip across the Pacific Ocean from Japan. And um, I'm sitting on the dock surrounded by these suitcases as my parents are sort of collecting themselves and getting ready to go off into, as my father said in his story, he, he, I thought he, he was such an evocative writer. I was stunned to know that. He said, uh, three quarters of the way around the world into the unknown. Um, so that's this little girl looking into the unknown. Um, you asked about what did what what was my what was my theme? Um, yeah, what's the moral of the story from the moral from that of little the story? Oh, okay, okay. Uh, it, it's something that my mother really impressed on me from the very earliest days, which is to dream big, dream big work hard, work very hard, and never, ever quit. And I think that's been sort of the underlying principle for my life, uh, both personally and professionally. And it's something that I, I, I hope everybody who reads this book sort of thinks about and understands that no matter what stage of life you're in, that's an important principle that will help you get from where you are to hopefully where you'd like to be. Well, as I say, story is our currency. And if it's our currency, you are an incredibly wealthy family in all the right and wonderful ways uh, of life. Uh, Peter, uh, Barbara, what a treat and honor to spend time with you and to share your story. What a discussion. I hope that that resonated with you as, as much as it did with me. Uh, this is an interview I won't soon forget. Um, and look, shout out to uh, Peter and the Milwaukee Bucks. You know, I, I'm breaking the code of podcast and time stamping this, but we conducted this interview uh, on the day that is sort of a national holiday uh, for basketball fans. It's the NBA trade deadline. So if there's ever a day where Peter Fagan, the president of the Milwaukee Bucks, needs to be near in near his phone and the coaches, uh, it would have been today. But he spent he spent upwards of 45 minutes with his mother and with myself to talk about this incredible book that I think should be in every classroom across the country, My American Dream, A Journey from Fascism to Freedom. You can get that wherever you get great books. But Barbara, what an amazing story. I mean, and just the anecdotes, talking about being chased by those other students when she herself was a young girl uh, and being labeled uh, a Nazi when, in fact, her father had fought with the Germans in World War I had given to his country and then was chased um, by the Nazis out of Germany to save his own family. Uh, the betrayal uh, and the fact that she experienced that as a young girl, I thought was an unbelievable anecdote. Uh, and the fact that she had gotten locked in that bathroom and didn't know how to get out uh, and then eventually was able to crawl through a window. Um, just what a very telling element of her story and the passion and the, you know, the, the optimism that there's always a way out. Uh, that really, to me, came through in the discussion with Peter and Barbara. So I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. Uh, thank you for allowing me to share some of my story. I felt like it was, it was warranted in this discussion. Uh, in a time when we are banning books across the U.S., we are, we are questioning uh, elements of our society that we didn't think we would. Uh, after the um, the devastation of of, of world wars uh, and the impact and conflicts around the world since then. So I think it's an important discussion. Uh, Barbara was an amazing guest, and uh, same with her son, Peter. I thought they were very transparent and open and giving of their story. And like I closed, really, story is our currency, and they are incredibly wealthy in all the, the right ways uh, that matter, I think, in life. So I hope you all enjoyed it. Once again, I'm your host, Dr. Rod Berger. Thanks for taking the plunge into Headroom, where we uncover the why behind the what and who impacting our lives. Headroom is a production of Rainlight and co-produced by our friends at Old Soul. I'm your host, Dr. Rod Berger, and this is Headroom. <laughs>